All right. Well, welcome back, everyone, um, and uh, welcome back to this amazing uh, uh, conference second panel for the See It, Stop It, Tackling um, Abuse in Amateur Sports. This is a, an amazing undertaking um, hosted by the Foundation of Global Sports Development and the Sidewinder Films. Um, make sure you go visit their uh, you know, their, their website at the globalsportsdevelopment.org. And um, if you have missed the previous panel, I really strongly suggest that you go and listen to the recording because it was uh, uh, very uh, informative. And I mean, there's no other option when you have that quality of panelists on board. Uh, you can't go wrong, you know, uh, just like this one that we're going to have coming up, uh, which is on healthy, positive coaching. Uh, and, um, and we're going to look at how that is a super important, if not crucial part of ensuring that, you know, everyone coming through uh, sport will have a positive experience and will find a safe place. And this is uh, for you, the audience, whether you're a coach, an athlete, a parent or an administrator. And we want to make sure you are empowered, uh, you know, in, in understanding, uh, recognizing and being able to act um, if you see abuse and, and also be more uh, active and engage in the positive aspect of it and, and how we can grow uh, a wonderful positive image for sport. And just as a little bit of um, uh, logistics uh, here, just a reminder that some of these discussions definitely can, um, can have an impact on, on people listening in and it can trigger different uh, emotions. And so we wanna make sure we share with you uh, the um, the number uh, that you can call or text, which is the child's uh, help hotline. And it's uh, in the chat. So uh, you can find it there, 800-1-800-422-4453. Um, reminding you guys too, tomorrow, uh, last session of the day, full on on resources. And so that's going to be uh, the place to, to be uh, if you want to get uh, the complete lowdown on national local resources. Uh, of course, training, education, uh, and and uh, and support uh, support resources. So, without further ado, let's welcome everyone uh, back once again, and welcome to our wonderful panelists and uh, and speakers. Uh, very quickly, uh, my name is Rebecca Corey, and I will be the moderator for this panel. Uh, I'm the founder of the Spirit of Trust, which is a new initiative in its infancy stage. And um, our focus uh, is and will be to have survivor-led uh, trauma-informed healing, holistic healing for victims of abuse in sport. And it's an absolute great honor to be part of this conference and to share my uh, next hour with all of you and, and our next speakers. Uh, I will do a quick, quick introduction. I know you guys read uh, on them and about them, and some of you may know them personally, uh, but... Um, just to make sure we get on the same page. So you've got Mr. Uh, Stuart Crone, who's an All-American um, all rugby player, graduated from University of California, Santa Barbara, who spent 13 years playing professional rugby. I can tell you that sh that has to take a toll on, on a man's body and mind. Uh, he traveled and played in France, New Zealand, South Africa, <laughs> Hong Kong. You know, these are no small nations in the sport of rugby. Um, and, and in 1999, uh, decided to, uh, to come back to the U.S. and, and start uh, an amazing, uh, at an amazing uh, school. He was one of the founding teachers at the Inner City Education Foundation schools in L.A. You have to go look at this website, and, and it's an impressive organization. And a few years later, of course, he developed the rugby program because what is the rugby player going to do? Um, and so through that program, uh, he's been, um, you know, empowering these kids and, and he's led uh, hundreds of them all over the world, all over the world. And I was just watching a video earlier and I had to stop because I was like, I'm going to be too emotional when I'm going to talk about this and start crying. No. So I'm keeping, I, I watched 20 minutes. I'm going to keep the rest for, for later today. Uh, but uh, amazing stories, and, and really you can see that they touch the lives of these kids. And then you have Miss Lisa Finnegan, uh, who has joined him in this uh, adventure about six years ago. 
and uh, she's uh, Irish born. So you'll recognize the accent when she starts talking, you'll see. Um, and uh, she is an extremely accomplished uh, young woman, young lady. Uh, and uh, she has uh, recently been named uh, on the women's high, com uh, high voyons, the women's high performance squad for Team USA. She's also a world rugby educator. Uh, that's an important piece when you want to be a rugby coach. And she won the uh, World Rugby Sevens um, Coaching Award last year. And just uh, recently in LA has been named a wise LA woman to watch. And so I suggest you go uh, do a little, um, you know, soft uh, Google stalking and go check her out on all her social media. She's, uh, she's very active and, and is doing great things. And she's been an educator with... Uh, uh, with Stuart at the uh, ISEF uh, schools. She's extremely passionate, transforming lives, uh, these kids, connecting with them, building trust, and uh, making them uh, amazing leaders through their experience in sport, positive experience in sport. Uh, and last but not least, um, we have a wonderful a young woman, uh, Grace French. She is um, the founder and president of the Army of Survivors. A little tidbit. Um, I spoke to Grace just at the very beginning when this was just an idea in her head. I saw an article connected with her and I was thoroughly impressed on my first conversation. So I'm sure you'll be um, as well. And this is a few years later. So she has a lot of experience in, uh, in, in her organization, which is amazing not-for-profit um, whose uh, main mission is to bring awareness accountability and transparency um, to sexual violence against athletes. And they've been quite active and building their team. So amazing organization. They will talk, uh, she will talk to us about their newest project, which is called Compassionate Coaching, very apropos for today. And uh, their goal is to uh, educate coaches so they can be uh, trauma-informed. And uh, she's been working with uh, survivor rights and advocacy for uh, the past several years and she's uh, on, on various platforms internationally and nationally uh, and um, one of the most impressive ones to, to note is definitely 2019 at the United Nations uh, General Assembly. Uh, she's also a current member uh, of, this is very important, of a Title IX advisory board for the Honorable uh, Elisa uh, Slotkin member uh, who's a member, sorry, of the U.S. House of Representatives for Michigan's uh, 8th Congressional District. This is an important uh, task because this is boots on the ground, concrete impact that she, that she can have, and I'm sure she has. Um, so this is who you have in front of you. And now uh, I'm going to zip it and let you guys uh, speak. So I will invite uh, each of you to um, first, you know, to break the ice and share your perspective and your experiences, basically what you've experienced as an athlete with your coaches, you know? So what are your coaching? Uh, what are the, the coaching you experience and how, uh, how has it affected you, et cetera? And so I'll start with, uh, with Grace, if, uh, if Grace wants to take the lead on this and let us know, and then we'll move on to Lisa and Stuart, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. That sounds great. Thanks, Rebecca, for the introduction. And mm -hmm. hi, everybody. It's so nice to virtually meet you. And thank you to Global Sports Development uh, for having me speak today. Like was mentioned, my name is Grace French. Um, I'm a dancer, youth coach. I'm a marketing professional, an advocate, founder, and a survivor. But before I was all of those things, I was a girl living in the suburbs of Lansing, Michigan, working toward her dream of becoming a professional ballerina. A game of Red Rover on the playground at 12 dramatically changed the course of my life when I sprained my wrist. And my parents asked, did the logical, which was to ask around um, for the best sports medicine doctor. And everyone said the same thing, which was to go see Dr. Larry Nassar. So from the age of 12 to 19, I saw him routinely. I was sexually abused at every appointment. I never questioned it in a single time. At 12, right around when the abuse started happening, I began to develop severe anxiety. I had concerns about my own safety, and it was linked directly to how I performed as an athlete and in school. I thought that if I didn't perform perfectly, that there would be devastating effects, like the world would end or my teammates would die. I had unexplainable headaches and stomach aches and fainting spells. And I had trouble breathing in high stress moments that my doctors attributed to asthma. 
I had this irrational fear of doctors that I couldn't explain. And I had difficulty like self-regulating, meaning I was overwhelmed easily or would cry or freeze in moments that should have been low stress. Those feelings would intensify when my coaches used touch correction without asking or when a routine had, that had been established at practice was broken or when expectations um, of me from my coaches and trainers suddenly changed without warning or communication. And I felt like my body was betraying me in my dream. In reality, my body was experiencing the trauma before my mind even understood it. So the way that trauma affected my body started to affect my performance. And I ended up dropping out of uh, dance for the time being because it was too emotionally draining to continue because the environments in which I was in were not trauma informed. They were unable to assess the situation, react in a way that would allow me to continue. So reflecting back, I realized that if the environment had been able to recognize myself as a trauma survivor and change the way that they interacted with me, I could have continued. And so for me as a coach now, I try to inform the way that I communicate with athletes and the way that I work with my dancers in order to make sure that if somebody is trauma, is a trauma survivor, that I don't offer more re-traumatization through the coaching that I do currently. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. That's uh, quite insightful, actually. Um, yes. Ooh. And um, uh, so, you know, when, when you talk about, uh, when you talk about that, we're, we're going to come back to the trauma effects and then how you envision that and how you envision uh, reinforcing uh, through this new program, right? I, I think you're going to connect the dots for us on that. Huh? Perfect. Awesome. Um, so Lisa, tell us, uh, you know, about your um, not so long ago experience as a, as a high performance athlete. Yeah. So just even if I think back to, um, you know, people who had or individuals who had such a massively massive impact on my life as a young woman. There were educators and coaches. And, um, you know, growing up in Ireland, um, I was provided, you know, I went to a great school, was provided some great opportunities um, and an equally amazing PE teacher who was just incredibly supportive and had some cre incredible relationships with all of her uh, players and students. Um, and as a multi-sport athlete, uh, she coached me in multiple sports and really was really made a huge impact on my life. Um, so when I left Ireland to go to university in London, um, I continued to play uh, international rugby, but it was when I was 24, 25, I actually met a mentor of mine um, that I'm currently uh, still uh, speak to on a regular basis. Um, and I was at a conference on the East Coast of America and I walked into one of her sessions. Her name is Emma Hayes. She manages Chelsea Women. And I remember being so incredibly inspired by this woman um, that I went up to her after the session, introduced myself. And I said, I was just so inspired by um, how you led that session. Um, and she became a mentor and a very good friend and taught me everything from emotional intelligence to how to get the best out of players. So I think from, from my experience, I was certainly, um, you know, I was impacted by two really incredible women early on and I understood what it meant to, um, what an effective coach was essentially. Right. So leading by example. An yeah, amazing, uh, yeah, amazing story for that. That's, that's great. Um, and, uh, and so we will um, loop back in on that and, and to connect it with what you're doing today and, and how you're basically taking uh, these amazing things and, and doing it with your kids yeah. Uh, at, at your with your groups that's amazing thank you so much um Stuart um you want to uh go on do you remember your athlete's experience so long ago <laughs> <laughs> right I'm kidding I'm kidding um all right Stuart please share you have to unmute yourself and then you can start telling us as you know, I was a multi-sport athlete from a very young age. And I started with swimming because that's what you could do at the earliest okay. age. And then bas traditional, traditional American sports, basketball, baseball, football. That's what I was exposed to as well as spinning and then a swimming and then, you know, like adventure sports that you could do along the way. But um, I think it's interesting when you reflect back on your coaches and 
when you have such a love of sport and like Grace said, they can impact you in any which way because they're your like, you love what you're doing. You see them as experts in it. So it's like, of course, you're going to look up to them and however they are. And um, I, it, as I'm listening to them speak, um, there's a particular coach that I had when I was 11 and um, who just had a lot of self-belief in me and he made me feel empowered. And I remember that feeling empowered by that coach. And that's stuck with me to this day. And then go, growing up and doing sports, starting then in school and then traveling around the world and then professionally, um, I was really... I had like all different kinds of coaches. So coaches that were coach centered, that were very sarcastic, rough, um, expected everything from you and weren't really f filling your emotional tank. And then I had coaches that like totally inspired me. So, and they became mm, like mentors, like Lisa was saying, they became mentors to me and I wanted to emulate them. And right now mm -hmm. what I'm doing with my life is an emulation of, um, uh, a great rugby coach passed away this year, George Simpkin, who is a New Zealand guy that went around introducing rugby around the world, particularly in Asia. And he was a great co coach, a World Cup coach. And um, I thought George was a mixture of two different kinds of coaches. He was like, he gave a lot of tough love. And he, when things got tough, you could look in his eyes and feel the steel and it helped, it helped you with your own resolve. So he's helped me with to have strong resolve and to, to not give up and get back up. Um, but also just like he had so much um, love and compassion for everybody on the team and he had a vision of spreading it. So that's what inspired me when I was in Hong Kong that maybe I could come back to America and start an inner city rugby program. And maybe it would have the same impact on those kids that it's had on me. And especially with the global aspect, traveling around the world exposure coming out of the community and to different communities and use rugby to bring people together and teach life lessons. So that's what I'm doing to this day. Right, right. And, and you know, you talked about traveling the world yourself as an athlete and, and how important it was to also connect that piece to the program that you have, because that's an additional piece of glue that's important. Yeah right the the difference right. in the cultures and yes. and uh, you know learning like you you said life lessons but you know in different contexts uh, and and having people um, i i saw the beginning of that video where that young lady recognized and 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 was seeing fiji, fiji and how it was similar to the guyana that her parents were from right. you know and so right. that that's an example like that it, it's you know it brings them it could bring them comfort but at the same time learnings etc so that that's really great very important um so it, we're gonna of course come back to to each of you throughout this thing and i i wanted to go back to grace and and to um uh and to basically ask you grace to because you're doing this new program, right? You're working on this compassionate coaching uh, educational program, and it's all about healthy coaching, positive growth, trauma-informed. Um, would you be able to share with us like your vision of the coaching environment, do's and don'ts, you know, and, and doing that through your lenses of um, the, the survivor and the athlete? W would that be um, good yes. with you? Okay. Yes, definitely. So um, just a little bit going back to what Compassionate Coach is and that, and that program that we're developing, we are working with leading researchers, psychologists, and evaluators from across the nation in order to create this program. Um, and we're really thankful for the generous support of global sports development as well um, and partnership in creating uh, the best uh, possible uh, program. So thank you to them as well. Um, the course aims to create compassionate coaches who are trauma-informed, like was mentioned, and support athletes who have experienced trauma, and then also work collaboratively, collaboratively excuse me, with support systems with, of athletes to encourage physical and mental well-being. So by the end of the course, the coaches will have developed a action plan for incorporating trauma-informed policies and practices into their coaching. And I know that trauma-informed can be a bit of a buzzword, and I hear from attendees that there's a little bit of a 50-50 chance of whether people understand what being a trauma-informed coach is. And to us, it means realizing that most athletes we work with have experienced trauma, 
then recognizing the signs of that trauma, responding effectively and adapting your coaching style to that trauma and resisting re-traumatization through that practice. So I implore this group to be really curious and not curious when you see athletes exhibiting signs of trauma. And that's the first step is really, instead of taking negative behavior personally, thinking about what that behavior is telling you and reframing mm. that. Mm. Um, the behavior is probably or most likely not aimed at you and maybe a protection mechanism for that athlete. And it's important to know also that you don't have to deeply understand that the trauma, the trauma that the survivor went through or that the athlete went through in order to respond effectively. So uh, you don't need to ask them what happened. You don't need to know their story in order to create an environment that's okay and not re-traumatizing for them. So some of the other ways that I see that are um, uh, sort of more effective would be uh, always working in pairs. This is helpful in case there's a power dynamic between a coworker or another coach that you don't know about. Um, creating a predictable practice plan so athletes know exactly what to expect. Making sure that trauma survivors know what is expected of them or all athletes know what is expected of them, perhaps through some sort of code of conduct that's enforced as well so that they know what they're getting into when they show up to practice and there are no surprises thrown in because that um, can trigger stress responses from trauma survivors because their stress responses are overreactive after experiencing trauma. And then another huge part is really allowing for team reflection. So making sure that you're collecting feedback and, and amplifying the voices of athletes so that you can assist in not only the processing for the athletes, but also in uh, gathering that constructive criticism for your team and your staff and implementing. Um, I think action is super important with that. You can't just have a feedback um, system like that you don't uh, react to. So those are, those are some of my big main points. Right, right, absolutely. Thank you. That's, uh, uh, that's quite concrete. I mean, I'm sure that the coaches uh, on, the, uh, on the call here uh, watching and listening uh, are taking, uh, like I just did, uh, very, you know, <laughs> extensive notes like this, 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 uh, because it's very true. It simplifies it when someone breaks it down for you. And as any good coach will know, a plan, uh, you know, tends to give you a greater chance of success and, and doing a, a perfect practice is also increases your chances of success. So this is uh, knowing the information and then how to digest it and, and use it. So thank you for that. Um, that's great. Um, so when, when um, I'm going to go to Lisa now, because uh, Lisa is, um, you know, has been in this program for the past six years. And, and so coaching is now uh, your, your everyday, uh, your everyday life. And, uh, and I think that the ICEF mission is a very uh, amazing fit with how you see, uh, how you see coaching. And so how, how, you know, can you tell us about your own development, you know, as, as a coach, how you've identified, you know, all of these crucial aspects uh, that, that you've experienced as an athlete and that you're now finding yourself uh, connecting uh, in your new role as a coach with, yeah. within your new community. Yeah, so when I came over from London to LA in 2015, um, I actually came and joined the alumni team, which included a couple of our high school students. So I came over uh, and automatically joined a competitive environment as an athlete. Um, mm -hmm. So it was completely different to what I do now, but it was there wasn't a great amount of time to form, de form and develop relationships uh, similar to what you would do in coaching. Uh, so that was my first experience. And, um, <laughs> and Stuart was the coach. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Um, so we went to nationals that year and did well. Um, and then, you know, fast forward six years later, um, I've had that experience of working collaboratively with, uh, with Stuart to, um, to develop strong relationships and to put safe, structured, and supportive um, practices together. Um, and yeah, I think um, developing as part of the ISEF rugby coaching team has been key because of the mission. Um, and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, uh, and I'm sure my, uh, Stuart will talk more on this, but it's not about, you know, preparing, you know, hyper competitive athletes. It's about developing leadership and, and building character through rugby. Right. And, and you mentioned uh, emotional intelligence earlier. Yep. 
right? Yeah. And that's something that uh, when when we talked, um, you know, that's something I I, I noticed uh, right away because, as we know, not everybody can learn and evolve, unfortunately, or at least not at uh, you know, the same level of speed or understanding. Um, and so certain things, unfortunately, you, you don't, you have to be, and then you can expand on them. But, you know, talk to me a little bit, if, if you can, about your, your, you know, how, how you see emotional intelligence and how, how you bring that to not just your coaching, but how do you then transfer that knowledge? If, yeah, if that makes sense. I think, you know, and I learned, I think, like I said, um, you know, from a mentor, it was watching her like Emma Hayes and how she used it at a high level, right? Used it with professional soccer players. And, yeah. and also through my own life experience of having to, you know, figure out life and relationships and situations mm -hmm. where you need emotional intelligence to, you know, learning to communicate, learning to listen, right. like be the one to shut up and listen. Um, and actually, as Grace mentioned really clearly, um, different ways that you can uh, get on side with, um, with you know the players that you're coaching um, and actually noticed it really well this year so I was in the classroom teaching virtually through COVID and I had five classes at the high school and it was quite normal for some of the rugby girls that I coach to stay after class um, mm. and completely comfortable talking about adversity that they were facing uh, challenges at home stuff that was demotivating and I think emotional intelligence, they they now realize through, I think, just the, the trust that's been built up over the last number of years that that's um, that that's something that you need to have to be able to connect with another human being, whether it's men or women. And I think emotional connection is just key to um, right. to that. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. No, exactly. Well, thank you. That's you know, it, it brings, I think, a little bit more perspective when when people uh, hear these different, as Grace says, you know, sometimes these buzzwords, but then when we explain them, you know, with concrete examples, it, it connects better with, with people listening. Um, and so now if we, if we go to Stuart, so, you know, Stuart, rugby, you know, it's not ping pong. Um, so we're going to assume that, you know, it's a rough, uh, it's a rough sport because it looks rough when you look at it uh, being played on the field. Um, and I'm going to assume that the training it kind of connects with that as well. And so when you've experienced throughout your 13 years of professional rugby, but the previous years also, I'm sure as, as just um, training amateur rugby, uh, you know, how, how do you uh, reconcile basically the friction between the old school coach and what you've seen um, and how you were brought up as, you know, the best player you could be um, and, and, and then how you are now, you know, this very positive, healthy, uh, you know, motivational coach. Um, and, and so how, how was your transformation, your evolution, you know, what are your key moments, uh, that you, that you, that you crossed and, you know, tell us a little bit about, um, basically how you transformed from, you know, living the harder, the harder model into becoming the you know, new and improved uh, future model. <laughs> yeah, that's an important point because to realize the coach that you are when you start out, just like the player you are, the person you are, isn't necessarily the coach you're going to be, you know, hopefully it's not that you're going to grow. And right, well, right. I think everybody, when we start coaching, we emulate those people that we, you know, really admired. So mm -hmm. if there's like that tough love and that's what they did for me and I responded to it, then I'm going to give back that tough love and think everybody's mm -hmm. going to respond to that the same way. But mm -hmm. it's like your previous panel said, and I think Grace might have met, everybody's different. So people are responding differently and sometimes you're doing triggers and kids are responding in a way mm -hmm. you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I didn't know why they were acting that way, you know? And so like, the other thing is like when you start out coaching, you want to be in control. You want to feel like you're in control of the situation. So often being in control is being controlling, you know? So that's, how, that's I think, how I was as a younger coach, also as a teacher too. Um, right. And then you develop over time and getting to know the community, getting to know the people and learning more about what they're experiencing, what they're going through, how they've been coached and other teams that they've already been, what the coaching culture and the player culture is in the community that you're in because it's not the same everywhere. 
it's not this one American right. coaching culture and that's what we all do. It can change from sport to sport, from location to location and just how the community works as a community. So there's all these differences and you need to be sensitive to that. So I guess I was forced to be sensitive to it at, in order to improve if I wanted to improve. Mm -hmm. One big thing, I think the, the biggest first change, and I'm thinking about this now, was a book I read um, from Rod McQueen, the great Australian international coach. This is another person who changed who he was from a coach cent uh, coaching-centered coach to an athlete-centered coach, and he talked about changing his approach. He talks about doing it with his team, and he also talked about it for the company that he ran and just mm -hmm. empowering the people around you. So first of all, like Lisa on this panel, like I was looking for a Lisa. It was a miracle that she came along. I was looking for a female rugby coach who was younger and, you know, was going to bring a wealth of experience um, with her. And that's who we found in Lisa. And, you know, it was mm -hmm. really wonderful. So she, she was transformative. So building out our team, you know, and that I'm not going to be the center of it. So now it's having all these other assistant coaches or kids that we taught some kids right. that we've known since elementary school. So now they're coaching. So it's another mm -hmm. person to, for the athletes to communicate with and understand. Mm -hmm. But well, anyhow, you're clearly that, building a succession plan. Exactly. I'm building you a know. succession plan, but it's also building a team so that to realize when we're talking about students, when we're mm -hmm. talking about traveling, when we're talking about challenges, mm -hmm. the season, COVID, it's a group discussion. It's an ongoing discussion so that together, right. including with the athletes, the high school athletes, we're making decisions together and that they're mm -hmm. empowered to know that, you know, in the film that you're watching right now, when we're going through Fiji and rugby's really rough. So talk about an interesting culture. Like in Fiji, they just play very aggressive rugby. They love it. You know, that full mm -hmm. body physical expression is an honored thing and you have to meet it. But at the same time, they're like the most compassionate, loving people, yeah. you know, simultaneously. So you're experiencing these things at the same time. We're getting crushed <laughs> right. on the field and now they're making us dinner. Yeah. You know? yes, and they're putting flowers around your... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your, Music, yeah, no, singing, dancing. Yes, we love you. Yes. We're going to play rugby now. Watch out. Let's go. <laughs> That's how it is, yeah. And after one of those games, I was talking to, to Lisa about it the other day. And the girls were pretty shocked. Shock, they had the shock and awe experience. And I went to the captain and I said, what do you think? Do you want to play <laughs> this next game? Do you think the girls are up for it? And the captain said to me, who's now joining our team. She just graduated from Cal a couple of weeks ago. She's now coming on board with us. But as a captain in high school, she said to me, I think the girls have had too much right now and they need a break. I don't think they're up for it, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the time I was thinking, hmm, she's not being tough enough. She needs to be tougher on the kids. I didn't say that to her. What I did was I listened to her, which showed a lot of growth for me. Because normally I'd be like, no, nah, get your jerseys on, go out there and play, tough it mm, out. Right. But I was like, I'm going to listen to her. I raised her to be this, I didn't raise her, I encouraged her right, to be right. a yes. leader and to have a voice, to have a voice. Mm -hmm. And she had the courage to tell me, I don't think we should go out for this next one. You know, I don't think the girls are ready for it. Like they were, they were traumatized <laughs> from the previous. Yeah game yeah and and when I look back on it now and me and Lisa would have talked about it a lot at the time and ongoing when I look at it now it was like that captain has such a strong voice right now she became the captain of Cal's women's rugby you know she was a captain mm. of college. and I think that yeah. was part of it was like listening like really listening even mm -hmm. at times when you think like hmm, I don't know if I agree with that but Lisa has a strong opinion about this or the captain or the students have a strong opinion mm -hmm. about it. That's part of my evolution. Okay, I'm going to trust them and we're going to go forward with this because they're being strong about it. And, you know, they. Right. I often think they're probably smarter than I am. So- Well, you, know, you chose them. them. You chose them yeah. to be with you and you wanted to strengthen your team. And so now you have to let go a little bit and- let them make that decision yeah, and then yeah exactly yeah. and to build yeah. that community of trust and like somebody right. in the previous panel wrote about how do you talk to coaches well mm -hmm. you talk to them like i need to listen to the parents you know like that's part of getting to know the community you know they're not telling me how to run the coaching sessions or anything like that but they're letting me know about what their kids are experiencing you know how they're growing how they're dealing with the season i want to listen to that because mm -hmm. I, I, they might give me something that's going to make for a better community. They often sure. do. 
just by listening, you're building community because as long as, as soon as people feel like they have a voice and what's going on, mm -hmm. then they're empowered. And that's, it's, it's our program. You know, it's ours. Right. We're building it. We're shaping it. This is who we are. You mm -hmm. know, so building that no, culture, uh, that's been the biggest exactly. growth. Yeah, no, that that's great. And, and then I see like Grace shaking her head, <laughs> nodding like, yeah, the voice is important and connecting uh, the community together and, and, you know, getting everybody's information, etc. Lisa, did you have something you wanted to add to that? To that specific thing? No, I think I Stuart did I, everything. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I thought I saw your hand go up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so basically, you know, we, we look, we listen to your, your experiences and how you're uh, building your team here and, and Grace's project on this uh, compassionate coaching. But, you know, the theme of this uh, conference is you see it, you stop it. And so at the end of the day, you know, prevention is key because prevention will stop it before it happens, right? So then we don't have to deal with it. Fortunately, we're not yet uh, at this stage where we just focus on these amazing prevention things and then everything's hunky-dory amazing. Um, but, and so, you know, I, I think I wanna tackle a little bit um, the other part of uh, see it and stop it, which in my view is, the response and, you know, the crisis response and, and the adjudication and, and the dealing with this stuff. So uh, how do you, um, how do you report? How do you educate? How do you sanction? And how do you service victims? Um, so, you know, basically, uh, you know, from Grace's point of view, if I can, if I can ask Grace to share with us, you know, what's, what do you think should be in place you know, in addition to this positive, uh, healthy uh, coaching environment to, to ensure a safer place. I, I know that you have a ton of stuff to say about that. So, you know, go all out for us. <laughs> well, I don't know if you have enough hours for this. But <laughs> well, exactly. Okay, I'm let's try and keep it. Let's keep it in, in, a, yes. in a very uh, effective list for the audience. <laughs> yes, I will try and hit as many points as possible. <laughs> Um, yeah. So just to give context to, to that question, I wanted to talk about a global study that was recently done in 2021 that found that 61% of athletes reported having experienced one form of emotional abuse at least once in sport. 37% of athletes experienced one form of physical violence at least once. And 13% of athletes experienced one form of sexual violence at least once. So there is an, an incredible opportunity for us to to be able to not only prevent, but also to respond to the survivors who are coming forward with their stories. And, and overall, the, the last statistic that I would like to share is that 69% of athletes felt that their best interests weren't at heart uh, of sport. And I think that's, that's heartbreaking to me because sport is supposed to be positive. It's supposed to help you grow as a person. It's, it's a career, but it's also this amazing experience that we all get, like it's part of humanity. So um, taking a moment to let that sink in, right now there's so much opportunity for reform um, and, and realizing and acknowledging that the child and the human should always come before the athletes mm -hmm. in everything mm -hmm. that we do. So I think prevention is key, but I think um, what we should also be taking um, note of is accountability. So how mm -hmm. do we create systems and processes and policies that are in place already that ad address how an mm -hmm. athlete reports and how the institution responds to the report? That should be written. That should not be something that is just hearsay or something that was mentioned once. That needs to be written down in policy as well as the repercussions for not following that policy. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing that I really want to stress is education of athletes. There was a recent study by Child USA that found that over 90% of athletes did not understand where to report if they experienced anything harmful in sport. And so that fact blows me away because although we have all these, these statistics of 61% experiencing emotional abuse, they don't know where to go when that happens. So having or even uh, if it's a reportable event. Exactly. So giving them the education and the language to use in order to report 
So I guess two points. First, to Rebecca's point, the language to use in order to report is super incredibly important, that education part. But then second, where to report, how to report. That should be a process that's written out. That should be a process that's uh, an education moment annually every couple of years for those athletes so they understand where to go if they do experience something based on those definitions that you have written out. And then if somebody does not follow uh, the process for uh, when they do receive a report, then there should be accountability for those people as well. Um, so I'll stop now. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, on, but I could continue. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, no, no. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great start. Definitely, you know, putting things in. Uh, I like to call them buckets, but they and they are also all um, connected, right? So the the have the the process laid out in documents, accessible, implementable, the right people uh, to educate, so people know what they're looking at, where to look at, where to go, all that stuff. Super important. Simple things, you know, mm -hmm. not brain surgery, uh, and yet. And yet, 90%, as you say, from that uh, Child USA study, um, not knowing where to go or, or even maybe what to report on. So uh, lots of work to do. And, and so I want to then pass that on to, um, you know, to, to Lisa. So internally at ISEF, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do you guys have uh, this kind of organized um, remedy? Uh, you know, yeah. recourse, you know, how, yeah. how, how are you organized when it comes to that? Just so, to give um, there, so there are, so ISAF wide, um, there are mandatory trainings that we have to do in advance of the academic year every year. Um, and I think even with ISAF rugby, we try and build a culture um, that is right. safe and structured, that supports, like Grace mentioned early, uh, earlier, kind of predictability. So, um, mm -hmm supports kind of growth and learning of um of our players on the field um and then also um, i think the relationships as well we place a huge focus on uh developing strong relationships so, so that if there are students that are experiencing or experience trauma that they do feel like they can approach us to um to have those conversations um and i actually I, this was a couple of years ago i read an incredible book by bruce d perry it was called um um, the boy who was raised a dog and it inspired me to find out more because I didn't feel like I was getting enough information on there wasn't there wasn't enough information so um, we actually brought over a fantastic woman from from Boston and her name is Megan Bartlett uh, from we coach um, and she provided this outstanding tra uh, training on trauma-informed coaching and teaching and outlined aces outlined trauma and outlined the kind of the effects on the brain and um, the strategies and tools that coaches and teachers could use um, and also a lot of our alumni coaches were involved as well with ISAF Rugby so again um, it's yeah providing the um, the education and then also the tools and strategies to use in the classroom and on the rugby field. And this is education for not only the coaches and the the people yeah. around so, yeah. the coaching but also the the kids the athletes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we had uh, we had physical education teachers, we had that coach rugby, we had high school coaches, and we had alumni coaches all involved. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, let me ask you this: so, as an administrator, um, you know, myself in, in a sport in sports organization, do you have at the school and and within all your schools a way where if there's an issue, if if someone sees something, they can mm -hmm. they can stop something, and so do they know? Uh, what rules they should follow and uh, you know who yes. they could go speak to and yes. those yes. types of things yes. that that Grace mentioned the, that, the policies that's, 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 that's in clear. there schools yeah that's okay. clear yeah. okay okay yeah. and that's you educate on that as yeah. well and that's part of the as part of the summer institute every okay. year in advance I see. it is okay. uh, it's incredibly important that everybody completes all right those to be to be ready for it yes yes no that that that's great um, and, uh, and so, you know, moving on now to because you're very community oriented, and I'll ask Stuart this question, because you have multiple, uh, I understand there's multiple um, actual physical buildings, right, you have multiple schools. And so there has to be a sense of community that's even greater when it comes to the response, the crisis response. Um, you know, we heard from the panelists earlier today, and they're from the Avalon Healing Center in, in Michigan. And 
what they do all day, every day is, you know, uh, they're there for, for victims uh, of sexual abuse throughout everything, not just a sport specific thing. So in the community, Stuart, do you guys have like external partners, kind of memorandum of understandings with, I don't know, the local police, uh, you know, station and maybe the uh, prosecutor's office or maybe, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the center, a crisis response center for, uh, for sexual violence and, and things of that nature. Like, did you guys create what they call a community, a coordinated community response well, or not yet? Well, we do because we're, we're as schools. So as, school, as schools were, you have to, we're, we're mandate, you know, we're mandated to, and you That's know, why report. Asking. Okay. So yes. we've, I've done that. I've had to do that. Um, in the 22 years I've been working here, I've, I've had to do it numerous mm -hmm. times. So it's just something we have to do with social services. There's like a pathway to follow. It's right. We're not the only ones doing it. It's manifesting itself in the classroom and right. drama and, you know, performing arts and everything. It's sure. coming out when something triggers it, it comes out. We have um, a really, we, we started an Embrace the Mind program at all our schools um, three years ago. So we have, we've oh. improved our counseling at all the schools. So there's sort of this pathway that they can follow. And then if it becomes more like they need more than what we're providing, then we can help okay. the families or the students to, you know, what right. they might need. So there's like a whole kind of social services side to things. I see. I see. Um, but that's really okay. like interesting, what you, like about, about getting student, uh, the students more informed on these issues. So that's something mm -hmm. we we instituted a few years ago. So, and Lisa's a part of that. We provide training for the kids and it'll, it might be instead of yeah. a, a practice that day where we're working with a sports psychiatrist that comes in, we've done mm -hmm. different things. We're working with it each year to mm -hmm. provi provide different opportunities for the kids to be more aware of like the whole social element and what they might be mm -hmm. going through and, and also right. like becoming more empathetic to each other and more supportive of of each other because mm -hmm. you never know what kids are experiencing and what they're, you know, currently going through. It might be right. homeless. It might be abuse. It might be yeah. suffering yeah. from some tragedy that happened within their family exactly. that mm -hmm. they're not openly sharing. So, you know, yeah. that's something as a school we've worked as a group of seven schools, we've worked hard to provide mm -hmm. more support for students to, you know, right. More support. But something we have to do, and it's surprising because I coached for quite a few years before I came here, and I never had to deal with the amount of things and the kind of things that I'm dealing with now, like mm -hmm. incarceration, like uh, murder, like different forms of violence, abuse, things like that. So you mm -hmm. grow in your ability to, I don't know be more sensitive to the situation. And, yes, and like of the, course. The triggers that might set things off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I think knowledge is power and, and, uh, and, and information helps you, uh, you know, and, and you never know how you're going to react to something you don't know or don't understand. So the more information you have, the more knowledge you gain, it, it cannot go wrong. Yeah, you know, like there, there's a lot less chances of a negative impact being over here with more knowledge than a negative impact with zero knowledge. Uh, and, and so let's take, let's put all our chances on our side and then let's increase, you know, the, the knowledge sharing and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the information sharing. So like you say, they were better equipped. And, and it's very important what you mentioned about, you know, being uh, the athletes around each other uh, you know, there's multiple studies out there that talk to abuse in sport and that also reflect on uh, abuse between teammates. Right. And, and that's a non-negligible, right. uh, it's right. a really non-negligible item. And yeah. when we look at the, the big tough sports, the boys team sports, mostly with the hazing going insane, like in the military model, uh, you know, that's that's a big thing to watch out for uh and and to make sure that there's there's limits and lines um and so so be, before we go in the q a um uh and i'm looking at the time and I, i've been told that i can extend a little bit to uh about by 15 minutes so 
we're, we're just going to go, um, you know, that, that next question that I want to ask was, you know, about actionable change and the impl uh, implementable community oriented and trauma informed programs, because we know the statistics, we talk about them all the time. It's been harped on over and over again. And I've been saying this for a great number of years. Okay, we got it. Yeah, there's a problem. Uh, now, what do we do and how do we do it? And you guys are uh, amazing because you've already started this thing. But I'm going to start with with Grace to, to see what her thoughts are on, you know, how do we transform the lessons into action? You know, so Grace, if, if you want to, um, you know, kind of uh, wrap, wrap up your thoughts for that, that'd be great. Yeah, so I think, firstly, I want to address taking account our own responsibilities to hold our communities responsible. We have the power to create accountability and One Voice really does create that change. So taking on that responsibility yourself to be that person who uh, spearheads responsibilities um, of those environments in which you live and work every day to create better environments for those you serve and those athletes, those children that you serve. Um, and second, I think it's really talking, talking about trauma informed. What does that mean? Actually defining it, really diving deeply into how you can create better environments. And one of those ways is through the Compassionate Coach Program. So if you are mm -hmm. interested in learning more, feel mm -hmm. free to go to our website, thearmyofsurvivors.org, sign up for our newsletter. We'll be sending out more information about it as we pilot in the next couple of months here. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I must, I must do for sure. Great, great point. Thearmyofsurvivors.org, right, Grace? Correct, yes. All right, Thanks. excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent. Um, no, it's important. Knowledge is power. Um, and uh, so, so Lisa, tell us what, um, you know, how do we do more? How, how do we uh, implement more and, and, you know, continue your growth over at uh, ISAF? Um, I think it, uh, it's very similar to what Grace mentioned. Um, I think it's, it's so important to understand the community that you're serving. Um, mm -hmm. So when I came over from London, I, you know, I had to do a lot of research. I had to, um, myself and Stuart were, were working together, but I had to read, I had to find out, you know, what was culturally uh, appropriate, what was, what, and ensure cultural sensitivity exists. And then almost assume that every child or participant in your group has experienced or is experiencing some sort of trauma and, and approach situation from that lens. And um, I think just, um, you know, having the, um, just having the perspective of um, of that trauma informed, um, uh, you know, issue right now is um, is important. Right, it's huge. And and you you mentioned a little bit in in your previous comments, and I didn't go back on it, but just to make sure the audience picked up on that, uh, you were talking about the impact of trauma on the brain, uh, the impact of the adverse childhood experiences, which is the ACEs and as I told you guys, you being in California are extremely lucky to have a surgeon general who lives and breathes um, ACEs basically, and which is the short for adverse childhood experiences. And there's amazing resources out there. Um, the ACE, uh, ACE is aware uh, website and they do webinars and they're training the entire medical community in California. Uh, so that that's going to have a, a very big impact on uh, on treatment, on understanding issues. You know, Grace mentioned at the beginning, I had these inex inexplicable uh, reactions and pains and headaches, and I'm like, yeah, they're explainable, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, she she didn't know, and and the people around her didn't know, but they are explainable, and and so I think what you guys are doing, introducing the ACEs knowledge and the ACEs training and, you know, basically the entire holistic trauma-informed approach is key. It's going to be, it's a game changer. It, it truly is a game changer. I'm so excited to see how, you know, you're going to see that and, and, and if you're going to be able to tell us in a year or, you know, in two years, how, how you've seen the impact happen. And, and um, so I'll ask Stuart, do you have any 
Uh, anything to add uh, from Lisa's perspective in, in terms of what you guys should be actioning in order to to continue your your positive growth? Um, just I really enjoyed listening to what Grace and Lisa had to say about that, and I'm in complete agreement with them. And just like something Grace said, you have to. I mean, I'm going to give an example. I do. I too have like I have a child who's playing competitive sport, and um, and you think everything's changed, but things haven't changed that much. And you're going to encounter in every sport, like as a culture, she plays softball in Southern California. It's incredible. Softball in Southern California is like rugby in New Zealand. It's so competitive right. from an early age and they're going for those D1 scholarships and they're out of school and they're into clubs. So we're in the club sports scene, which is a whole nother animal and a whole nother mm -hmm. discussion on, you know, the mm -hmm. changing of what sport's about in America, especially for youth. And um, mm -hmm. when they get into that culture, right, which is mm -hmm. very old school again. And, and those people managing those clubs, they run it the way they're gonna run, run it. That's often why they've left the little league or other league so they can have their own, you know, run it. And we've seen, we've experienced, um, you know, abusive coaching that was going on, you know, within the team that my daughter was in. And um, it's just finding the courage to speak to the coach and speaking mm -hmm. league as a whole and not mm -hmm. putting up with it. Like that's not acceptable. And it might be to somebody else's daughter. Like they might, there might be abuse to somebody else's daughter and people mm -hmm. don't know, well, maybe this is acceptable. I want to be a part of this team. This is the path. No, sure. it's not, not acceptable. And you mm -hmm. can speak up. And if they're not, first of all, that person needs to grow. Maybe mm -hmm. they are, you know, there's something there and they need to grow as a coach and nobody's ever told them or they haven't been told it enough. I, mean, mm -hmm, I can say mm -hmm. that as a part of myself, you know, like people are telling you, no, it's too much on the sideline. You're too much on the sideline. You're thinking, well, it, this is what motivates, motivates my kids. I know them better than other people do, but you mm -hmm. keep getting comment from people, you know, like it's not working. That's not the right approach for our right. children to start thinking. For yeah. me, it was seeing myself on film. Honestly, it was seeing myself on film because sure. I had heard it from plenty of people. And then when I saw myself and I didn't like what I saw, I didn't mm. know what I saw, and that was that was a game changer for me. I got that's not the coach I want to be, or that's not the well, coach I thought, who I thought I was. Yeah. You know? and, well, that's a good. That's a really a good piece of intel, Grace. You need to take note of that. Compassionate coaching, practical training, do a film, and then assess your performance as a coach. Another yeah. coach told okay. me that. Another coach We're told me that. He told me to yeah. watch myself on film and he said that's what he had been doing. He was just getting himself filmed at practice. He told me that, that that's, that's what in New Zealand, that's what they were doing with a lot of coaches, filming well, them and showing it back to the coaches. And then you really see who you are. When you train, you have a huge part of the training is do the video, especially when in, in uh, you know, individual sport, do the video and then analyze every single friggin' thing you do. Yeah, and you can uh, so, analyze yourself. And you analyze everything. You analyze yourself, and then introspection is is kick, is is really uh, good. So, so I think that uh, what you what you just mentioned is is an amazing segue into this very important question that uh, that that we need to have your your take on, which is where's the line? You know how how do you describe that line, the invisible one? That is just between the tough coaching and the abusive uh, coaching methods, you know. So maybe we can start with um, with Grace on that. Uh, if uh, if if you have something to uh, to tell us, yeah, I'm sure you do. Of yeah, course you do. <laughs> of course I do. Um, of course, it's simple simple to me is that tough coaching does not cause trauma or re-traumatization and abusive coaching does. And I think as coaches, this becomes uh, scary because it's a little bit unknown. Like what do we, we don't quite know exactly what is gonna cause trauma or what's gonna re-traumatize, but that's where that line of communication is so right. important and key with those athletes is having that open feedback, having that time of reflection, making sure and adjusting as you go. I mean, we're not perfect, and there may be times when we do trigger our athletes or we do re-traumatize on accident. It's important to address it, to uh, figure out how you're going to not do that again mm -hmm. and adjust. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, 
So talk to your talk to your athletes, understand them better, uh, understand if there are triggers and what motivates them. And, and that's a good discussion that yes. you can pick up with uh, my friend I connected you with uh, the other day. Yes, he's JT. an expert in that. <laughs> he's, he's, he's the man. Um, so, so Stuart uh, or, or Lisa, sorry, I'm going to I'm going to start by Lisa um, and telling us, you know, your, your view on that line uh, between tough coaching and abusive coaching. I think that's an important question. How I see myself right now is my role as a coach, um, you know, over the years and how I've developed. And um, it's really about enriching the lives of your participants and our, of the players who come through that come through ISF Rugby. And there are different approaches that you can take. And it's mm -hmm. up to, you to figure it out how to, I think there was a question earlier, I think Darren um, asked, how do we get the best out of the players or athletes? And it's, a, it's figuring it out and it's trying out different styles and it's observing best practice and it's seeing what works, what doesn't work with different people. Um, and luckily, uh, when, we when you have that, that culture that's created and the foundation is there, uh, that will support um, the development of socially, emotionally intelligent um, participants mm -hmm. in the classroom and then on the rugby field as well. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really interesting because you talk about individual style mm -hmm. and differences, but yeah. you're in a team sport and that wouldn't be the automatic uh, you know, people say, oh, it's a team. Eh. Yeah, but I think one thing that I have learned is, and this is from Emma Hayes, she actually considers her uh, players on the field like different types of cars. You know, a Ferrari might need more attention. Yes. Oh, I love it. Or focus might need, you know, uh, she said she didn't have some of the play her players' in, uh, numbers in her phone, so she would just leave them. So there are, and that's what I meant when, with different approaches. Um, and I think that's what I've learned a lot more this year as a result of like, there's more need in the community now. And that you did that social and emotional connection with another you know, uh, with some of our players is key as well is to is to um, facilitate their learning and growth by giving them tools to self manage and giving them tools to self regulate, right. and right. Um, because that's that's what's gonna that's that those are the um, the essential coping mechanisms that you need as a human to function. Right. I think um, so. You're either adding to <laughs> their trauma oh, right. stress or you're not, and you're being intentional about how you're supporting. And like I said, individual players or a team as a whole. Right, right. No, I love that. That's the, you know, the, talking about the transferability of the skills. Mm -hmm. And so many people say, you know, what you learn in sport, leadership through sport, then you can become this thing. Yeah, that's great. But if you have it done the right way, if you yeah. know how to translate and use that and, and actually transform it into the mm -hmm. real world, right? And so I think those are really important pieces to to talk, to repeat i'm going to repeat you said self manage and self coping yeah. and self regulation basically giving the tools and the uh, empowering these uh, these athletes into having these coping mechanisms so they can then use that in mm -hmm. any area yeah. Uh, on a right. regular basis as well you know right and part right. of our rugby practices we we do it all the time in different ways and when i was teaching virtually i had, a, I had an intentional sel check-in with students and it was an opportunity -E -L. Social Self. And emotional learning check-in yeah Self okay yeah okay. so it was an intentional part of their day that they could uh, like you know if there was something on their mind that they could respond to a question that required reflection mm -hmm. or engagement um, right and Right. Because if you, if you don't provide that intentional uh, time for students or players or wh whoever you're working with to share, then they don't have the opportunity. So they have everything on, like it's going to boil all over at some point. Right, right. And, and that's really interesting because I'm looking at the comments now um, at the same time here. Hang on. Uh, and, and I'm seeing some, uh, some comments on this tough coaching. So uh, Darren mentions, Tough coaching, I thought was old school, um, and so making them do the those sprints and not work at working hard in practice and basically giving them yelling a little bit, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and and uh, JP, so Jean Paul Richard making a comment here. I think that's that's interesting. Uh, basically saying, you know, you don't need to have so uh, so much structure in coaching. You have to let it also. I'm, I'm if I'm understanding right the adaptability to the uniqueness of the individual and what works for them 
and what doesn't work for someone else. And I thought my experience as an athlete, I've seen that uh, between coaching men and women, that was a huge, there was a huge difference. You know, you couldn't criticize too much the women. They were already hammering themselves on their own. No, no need to add. But the boys were very different. And the motivation, they needed something a little bit more extroverted. And you saw the, the, the girls were completely different as well. And so it's that uniqueness that you talk about. But, you know, back in those 90s, 2000s, when we were athletes, um, our coaches were not necessarily... Um, adapted, adapting to, to that, you know, it, it was more like, this is the square, I'm going to put you in here. And this is how you're going to do this. Um, so Stuart, do you have a, um, do you have a, another, um, something else to add between uh, what uh, Grace and Lisa said to add to this defining or recognizing that line? Or how do you differentiate tough coaching to, um, you know, no. Well, everybody, every coach is different and you have to be true to yourself. So, you know, I mean, you're going to grow and you're going to develop, but you have a character and character traits and that you yeah. expect an athlete as a dancer, as a performer, as, you know, anything. And you have to be true to yourself, even though you're going to grow. So the way I coach is very different from the way Lisa coaches, but we're coaching together. What's interesting mm -hmm. about our program, though, is like, well, I'll send Lisa over to coach the boys. So like our sure. kids are used to being coached by women and men in rugby, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is really awesome. That's transformational yeah. for the group. And that's something that they really oh, love about it is because the girls team and the boys team, they travel on the bus together. They go on tour together. We create like this big co-ed unit. So, and just all of us are different from each other. So that's something that's recognizable and acceptable. Something that- right. I want to say something about what Grace said is that you're going to have moments where maybe you got triggered. Some kid triggered you <laughs> and mm, like you lose your temper yes. and, um, and you feel like it's like, they're doing it all the time. Why is this, why is this happening? <laughs> and, like your uh, children, they know like, the button. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I think, I think, you know, without being abusive and being open to communication, you do, you also need to give yourself grace. That's the one thing I wanted to say to the panel. Like the one thing I wanted to give away is that mm. I'm not the coach now that I was 20 years ago. And that also I need to give myself like, look, it's not, abuse is not acceptable at any level, but you have to mm. give yourself grace and room to grow. You're going to make mistakes, just like the kids are going to make mistakes. Right. You're creating right. that environment where it's safe to make mistakes. That's how we grow. It's safe for the kids. You don't want them so tight that they're wound up and I'm going to, they're right. all going to, we're all going to mess up in the game. That's what happens. And then we have, you know, successful moments. A debrief. Yeah. And then afterwards, <laughs> as a result, we do reflection sessions. It's something that oh, we often well, do. Go. So that's where the kids are talking about it. But as a yeah. result of COVID and us, we trained every Tuesday mm. and Thursday, the entire school year for most of it, it was online. And then we oh, trained wow. the last day of school. And um, we started during, during COVID at the end of our online workouts, we would have a reflection session and there would be a subject and every kid would speak to that. And oftentimes it was light and sometimes it was serious the election, what was going on, you yeah. know, everything that has been going on, COVID, yeah. different things that these kids are, maybe that's the place where they're going to talk about it because they mm -hmm. might not be talking about it at home. I don't, so mm -hmm. it became a same, a safe place for like, everybody looked forward to the end of training where we would, everybody, we would go around and we'd popcorn and everybody would say something, even if it was a small thing or something. And then, you know, kids sure. became more expressive over time. And it's just become a habit. We kept it going once we got back to live training. I don't know if we're going to keep it in next year after each session, but but it just became therapeutic for us to be able to, not for everybody, for the coaches, because we were all dealing with the trauma of this year that we've been going through. And there's and so much. So mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. place where people can communicate with each other safely is just a vital Huge. thing. So, um, Huge, yeah. yeah that's yeah. And like, that's coming from a guy who was a really tough coach and was used to, you know, so we're not going to be the same people that we were so long ago. The players aren't going to be the same at the end of the season. I'm not going to be the same. We're all going to be touched mm -hmm. by the journey that we share together, you know? Right. Exactly. You have to come with that open, open mind, open heart, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, understand that it's a, it's a journey. Um, you know, there, there's the destination is, is really, um, 
further well, along. I mean, um, that's the really so. big point, Rebecca, though, is like, why are we doing this coaching? Is it to make a, tr a are these kids going to become like ballet dancers for, you know, the Met? Or are they just, are they going to become good human beings that have this wonderful experience, hopefully right. through their teenage years, because most kids and girls in particular quit sports because they no longer relate to yep. it. It's no longer fun. And, fun. and usually because the expectations of the coach or the parents do not meet the expectations of the girls. And I don't, I can talk about any, anybody, they might be the right. best player on your team and maybe they will dance for the Met but the main reason when they're 14 year old is to, that they're there is because they want to make friends with somebody else and have a positive social experience and through those mm -hmm. social experiences that's how they grow that, that's how they grow emotionally and socially right, right. whether they become right. a professional athlete or they become a lawyer or a great parent or a good friend the longer we keep them in sports the better they're going to grow, you know, when we have the attention of that growth. So that's our role is to keep the kids active and keep them involved, not right. wanting keep to Keep them quit. motivated, right? Keep them you motivated, filling keep them their motivated. tank. Yeah, that's exactly. Role. Are we emptying exactly. their emotional tank through the session or are we right. filling their emotional tank through the session? And right. it's look at it th that way. That practice that I just had, was that motivational? Are they coming back? Are they looking forward to the next one? Or are they right. walking? practice like with dread yeah. in their eyes because we're going to be punished or we didn't play well and now we're going to do like somebody mentioned sprints mm. that's the worst like sprints. Right, yeah. i mean we're, we're doing sprints because we want to be fitter because we sure, want sure. to yeah, yeah, stronger yes, not because it, we're being punished it. because we didn't right. do well or right, any right. punishment any form of you know well yeah. because that that crosses that line the line right. of you know abusive coaching has, exactly um in the practice or in the feedback and the debriefs or on on the field of play it's about psychological abuse or physical abuse because uh, that's really all that can happen in those instances but it's that repetitive and it's like you know using the completely uh insane things of dehydration or <sighs> or a zillion push-ups or exactly. run around the track like you're, you know, going to fall. And, mm. and then there's kids who die. So it's a, you have to be intelligent and smart. So I, I think that um, I, I really liked how you guys all had like a little different way to, um, to address that and to define it. And, and I think that the, uh, at the end of the day, you know, that line uh, does not, you don't want to cross that line because you are going to focus on building the people up, uh, you know, looking and doing that check-in of that social and emotional, um, you know, uh, thermometer or barometer, like where are they at and refilling their tank, uh, you know, and, and being, uh, being there for their growth in a positive way, giving them skills that they can transfer into, into real life. And, and that's, that to me is, is concrete because, you know, you guys are right there on the ground. So you're using concrete terms and concrete actions. So that's what you do. You're transforming it. This means these actions, not these actions, you know. And, and I, I think when, um, you know, Jean-Paul here mentions, you know, more geared towards caring coach, coaching, the passionate coaching, that process oriented rather than uh, you know, the very uh, stringent and in the box coaching. And that marries well with what uh, Grace and her partners are going to be working on uh, in that com compassionate um, uh, coaching education. So, you know, we're, we're coming to the tail end, uh, you know, of, 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 the, um, uh, of the session and of the panel. Uh, we, we did go a little bit over, but I was told that that was okay because we're the last panel of the day. So that's always, you know. This is a nice spot to pick, um, <laughs> you know, note to self. So I don't know if you, uh, if Grace or Lisa or Stuart, uh, if you have something that you want to, to say, like to wrap up and have a, a conclusion, like a little bit of a summary uh, statement, uh, Grace, if you have something, um, I'll, I'll let you guys do that. And then I'll just, you know, end it for us. Yeah, I think my summary would be empowering athletes to uh, have their own voice, using education as a tool to allow those athletes to have the resources that are needed in order to report and to create accountability in your organization. 
Um, and then really understanding the power that you have as an engineer, as a coach to create those positive environments and to recognize, respond, and resist re-traumatization re in the communities that you work in today. And thank you all for coming and uh, connect with us on uh, our social media for the Armenian Survivor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Uh, Lisa? Yeah, so just to reiterate what I mentioned earlier, um, I just feel, uh, for me professionally, I just feel so uh, connected to the kids when, when I view my role as enriching uh, their lives in whatever way that I can. Um, and that just happens to be as an educator and as a coach. Um, and then also, um, I think Darren asked, um, you know, getting the most out of athletes. I think because I'm a current athlete myself, one of the things because I've been in classroom uh, this year has been, I've seen myself as kind of an inspiration for, um, for the players and the girls that I coach to, um, you know, to, to do whatever it is that they want to do, whether it's playing on the field, playing at the highest level. Um, and I feel most empowered when I'm playing. So that automatically, you know, it's something that you want to share um, and, and encourage as well. So um, yeah, it's, you know, um, it is a privilege to be in a, in a coaching position and as, as an educator and um, I've learned and grown a lot um, as a result of um, specific and most recently with, with trauma informed coaching. And it's, it's definitely something that I consider regularly um, and how I approach situations and conversations because mm -hmm. um, it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. well, yes, yes, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, Stuart, do you have a, a little conclusion for us? Yeah, just like, I know I was a little apprehensive about, you know, being a part of this panel because it's so sensitive subjects. It's like, it's deep mm. and um, I often feel like a, like a bull in a China shop when I'm dealing with stuff and, and um, just like, I want to, but I'm really big on like, get involved. If you care about youth and you want to have an impact like do get involved with coaching. It's so rewarding, especially when you're done playing or even when you still are playing. It's just the most rewarding thing to see children grow. That's the best mm -hmm. part of being a teacher and being a coach is watching them grow. And if you're lucky, you'll get to know them when they're adults and see that growth. And then you see them sharing with others. That's the beauty of it. Like that happened mm -hmm. for me, like that happened for the others on this panel that we're sharing right. what we've learned along the way. And it's really, really important know that kids are involved in different activities that's how they grow that's how they mm -hmm. enjoy life and then they turn those passions that they had for those those that they had when they were young and they can be passionate in life afterwards about other things you know that they can move that passion forward so not to be afraid to get involved you know get mm -hmm. involved but you're going to grow as you right get it. so i guess i keep repeating right. So that's what I want. No, to no, you actually you don't. You're you're adding new new things uh, every time, and uh, uh, I think it, it's great. You you guys touched on you know all the important things. At the end of the day, you know, being a coach is not only a privilege, I think, Lisa, but also a huge responsibility. And you um, have to take this seriously, and you have to learn and educate yourself. You have to understand. Um, the people you're working with, the, the environment you're in, you have to uh, learn about yourself and, and be uh, constructive the same way that you want to be for the athletes you have in front of you and with you, you want to be and you must be for yourself. And so continuous education, learning, growth, etc. cetera, a uh, huge thing and very important to, um, to keep that going. And so I want to thank you very much for um, your time and your thoughts and your knowledge. Most importantly, your expertise uh, with your lived experience. Um, this is really um, very valuable. And, and that's something that I know we want to put a lot of emphasis on when it comes to our organization with the Spirit of Trust is, you know, the lived experience expertise is tremendously important and it's like gold and you need to understand that learn from it and and have more of it <laughs> um so i just want to wrap up and let the audience know uh, first of all thank you so much for taking your time today if there was uh any questions that came up in the chat that were not answered uh, i know that the team at the foundation has kept uh, a record of that and that will address those questions 
either tomorrow or if uh, there's any other way to do that. But my understanding was that tomorrow at the last session, all the questions unanswered will then be resolved. So thank you so much for everything. And tomorrow, uh, join back at, uh, I believe it's um, uh, the first session at 11 a.m. A uh, great session. You talked about uh, accountability for enablers and institutions. This is the panel to listen to. You're going to hear uh, Professor Amos Giora from the University of uh, Utah. He's a, a lawyer by trade. Um, he's an author, wrote a book called The um, Armies of Enablers. And um, his uh, next mission in life is to bring accountability to enablers, you know, those people who re-traumatize you because uh, they don't want to deal with your issues. Yeah, those guys. So he's uh, an amazing person. And he will have also uh, with him Jonathan Vaughn, uh, as um, a formal NFL player and survivor uh, talking with him. And uh, the last session at uh, 1215 Pacific time with uh, the resources. Thank you so much and everyone have a great day.